All right, we should get started. Can we bring down the house lights so you guys can see the screen? I'm a, I'm a um, real stickler for contrast, and that goes way back to my visual effects film days. Like, you gotta have the contrast. All right, thank you so much. So um, thank you for coming uh, bright and early, but uh, it'll be worth it, I promise. It's gonna be a lot of fun. So we have uh, three cool projects to talk about. So we're gonna move along and uh, have Satari start on the first one. So my name is Habib Zargapur. I'm a virtual production supervisor at Unity. And I focus on anything film related so that we can take the real time tools and apply them to make the process of uh, pre-visualization or previous to layout uh, LED screens, final pixel, compositing, all of that stuff uh, it, it are things that we want to apply uh, to, to the process of filmmaking just to help speed things up and, and speed up communication and get better, better projects. Um, I'm Satara Samandari. I'm a VFX artist for this project, but I do many more. I'm a creator and I love using um, Unity technology. It's amazing to use real time versus compositing the traditional way. I love it. So we'll be covering uh, different things uh, to do with the Unity side of it, as well as how we apply these uh, tools on, on real projects. So uh, we'll be talking about the Unity virtual camera, the high definition render pipeline, which we abbreviate HDRP. Um, we'll talk about an LED screen project uh, that Satara directed, and tools like Timeline, uh, the recorder, and, and uh, HDR EXRs, which are necessary for a, a VFX pipeline to get uh, final pixel uh, shots out right out of the engine. And uh, we're going to cover Dark Asset, which is a project, it's, it's a feature film that has not been released yet, uh, but we got permission to show a few snippets. Um, I'll talk about Comandante. This is a submarine uh, uh, film, World War II submarine film, uh, being directed uh, uh, by Eduardo De Angelis in Italy. And um, we'll go into details about that one, and uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up with a um, music video that Satara directed called Bree 3. All right, Dark Acids. So um, this project um, is very exciting because it has a lot of virtual production, you know, virtual, um, we, I, we used um, a real-time engine um, for um, integrating the green screens uh, to this movie. The movie, uh, the director is called, is Michael Winnick, and um, I did the um, VFX for the movie. Let's go to the trailer before I start so we kind of get the feel about. Fine, I'll bite. Crank up the sound. What's your story, John? I'm part of a secret spy program that implants microchips into people's heads to make them super smart. Has that line ever worked for you? Microchips have been doubling in power every 18 months for the last several decades. I was a finely tuned weapon. The human brain, on the other hand, has remained virtually stagnant in the last several thousand years. And that was before the chip. Soon after my chip was implanted, I met an agent. Like that thing inside your head does a lot more than the doctor said. The doctor? Dr. King, the one responsible for the whole program. He wanted to push the technology forward and finally make a super spy. You'll be better than before, smarter and more skillful in every way. You'll have the calculating power of the most advanced microchip ever invented. There won't be anything you can't do. All right, Mr. Super Spy. What am I thinking right now? How do I get rid of this devilishly handsome stranger? You're half right. Which half? Not the one you were hoping for. So what just happened? As I said, the chip's still a work in progress. Maybe they should have perfected it before they implanted it in your head. There was a version of the chip before. Oh! But this time, they would have total control. Go get him. 
Aren't you breaking some spy code by telling me all this? Once you get into trouble. Already did. It's a kill switch, abort! It's not working! Hit it! Abort! You have an uncontrolled, dangerous military asset offsite. John Doe was supposed to follow orders. The chip leaves him no other option. Perhaps he still is. Who is it? His own. There will always be some guy who wants more power. For the chip program, begins and ends with Dr. Kane. I shouldn't be so hard on you. I'm just a lowly office drone. Please, continue. So, when you're um, doing um, any movie as a creator, it's super exciting to be able to have a lot of options. For this movie, most of the visual effect was done. Um, some of them were done on green screen, but we had a vision that we already know um, that I have access to um, real-time engine. So. Um, you know, when we talked to the director, we talked about the environment that um, they felt like they wanted to have. And um, of course, it was built in Unity. Um, lighting and everything was done. And then we brought in the green screen. Um, we shot it before and then we brought it in. Um, so there was camera tracking. There was uh, uh, live action integration, uh, which um, I'll show you. And then the, the good thing about the, the engine was that we were able to do Final Pixel um, HDRP, um, and um, you know I was able to bring it back to Nuke and uh, composite those afterwards. Um, so it just gives uh, the creator so many options, and there are many ta talented individuals in the world that don't have access to resources to make um, amazing um, uh, sets that they have in mind. So you can just build it in Unity and use it, right? Um, do you want to play the chip first? Yeah, I was playing it. Okay. So this is this is one of um, the uh, facilities that um, the agencies are using for this whatever their top secret project is. Um, those elements, if you go to the next slide, are um, all done on um, green screen, and then um, we. I was able to bring them in and then there was a camera, the camera move is afterwards. So if you plan it correctly, um, when you film it the way you want it to be afterwards, there is camera moves added, then you just bring it in, set them in, and then um, add extra camera moves to, to your shot. Some of the nice features of this technique are that you automatically get integration of the live action into the scene lighting wise. And also, if you look at uh, Robert Patrick, this is the T-1000 from Terminator. Um, he's got volumetric shadows. He's casting shadows on the set. Uh, his movements are all you know, in integrating into the scene. Uh, Setar was able to create the hologram look for the uh, two holograms you know, outside in Nuke and bring them in uh, basically as uh, elements that play inside the 3D scene. So, you can do this technique if you don't cheat the angle too much, because obviously the, the plate photography is 2D, so you can't like go around and <laughs> shoot them from the side, but you can definitely do a little bit of uh, parallax and moves like that. Um, if you were going to do, there, there has been moments that we, we thought about, like if depending on the project, you could actually um, scan your models and have a 3D version of them. Um, rig it. Um, there was another project that I did that um, it's called um, the Res One Garden. Rig, rig them 3D and bring them in and just shoot them that way. If you don't need their like face motions and it's from far, you could cheat it that way as well. It's pretty simple. Um, let's go to the next one. Oh, yes. That sorry. one, yeah. That is the pro volume is actually very, very. Um, um, useful and helpful because it just integrates um, um, 
the real lighting in, in um, on the on um, our talents, uh, and um, it bounces light exactly as if it was in nature, right? Would you like to explain a little bit more about yeah, um, pro volume? That's um, fav Habib's favorite pro volume, <laughs> and it's a new and way to do lighting. Uh, basically, instead of using light maps, you bake the lighting into these pro volumes. You just give it a, 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 an area you want to work with, and uh, it will take care of the GI bouncing, and you can tell it how many bounces you want to calculate at what density, and it'll bake in four seconds. You know, you don't, you're not waiting. Uh, and then there's no distinction between dynamic or static objects. So if a, if a 3D character moves through the scene, it's going to get lit by the pro volumes. Or if you have a static object, it'll be lit by them. Uh, and then you can still add real-time ray tracing and SSGI on top. And then uh, the engine can decide as it's uh, rendering different objects. The big thing with pro volumes is it's a per pixel interpolation. So the thing with traditional probe lighting, the old the old fashioned way I call it, the, the regular probe lighting, um, it picks, it interpolates between the three nearest probes per object. So the entire object would get only one probe lighting, basically. So you have something really bright here and really dark there, uh, and, you, and you have different objects, they're gonna look very different next to each other. Whereas with probe volumes, it's doing a per pixel interpolation of all the probes. So it, it will give um, a very, very close match to what uh, the real set would have looked like. And um, the cool thing about this is that um, with the director, we were exploring different areas of the set where to put um, our um, green screens, what camera move we do, and it was just done real time um, on Zoom with the director figuring out different, um, different um, uh, camera angles and uh, different lenses. And uh, we decided for this particular shot to just do this. And there's um, many different ones um, that we, we did. And it's just very, very easy. You just do it instantly. How do I go full screen again on this? <laughs> I keep getting the bar on top after I play videos. But There's F11. F11. This one? <laughs> Let's see. Uh, that doesn't look like F11. Where's the function keys on this thing? Actually. Hmm. Yeah, I don't see function keys. Or it's really hard to read. Is that, is that this guy? Or uh, one of these? So while we're finding F11 on this keyboard. This one? <laughs> uh, one thing that uh, I got very excited like about the the using uh, the real-time engine was that um, you get to light it um, as you go through the project differently whenever you want. You get to change the colors in real time after you shot your camera move with the director. You get to go back and um, enhance uh, to make it a realistic look as you, you know, you're uh, fixing, you know, bringing up the, like the last um, shots to, to final uh, you know resolutions when you want to um, uh, deliver the last uh, for example ProRes or HDR shots to um, for final so yeah. this is this is um, the green screen shot beforehand and you know the the track markers are helpful um, if there is camera moves there was some um, examples of that there was camera move on on the green screen on the set uh, the track markers are helpful. Also, uh, what we have um, is uh, I use the, the iPhone um, 12 Pro to track the, the actual RE camera on set to be able to bring the, the, um, the actual tracking back um, into Unity to match what we had on set uh, with um, our, um, our um, uh, green screen with, uh, with the Unity set. So that is super helpful. The uh, you know accessibility to have HDR um, final renders are very very useful. Um, you can preview um, the virtual set in real time. <clears throat> you can do the keying on set and just composite uh, your virtual background and then the the green screen characters and make sure they fit. 
and, and get a preview of if there's going to be a camera move. Um, the depth sensor on the 12 Pro is uh, precise enough to give you a pretty good idea of where the camera will be. And then, of course, Setar does the final tracking, uh, per, you know, pixel tracking uh, herself afterwards. But this way, at least she has the, um, the rough camera move and a, a way to tell where the set goes. Notice um, they're pretty evenly lit because at the time of the shoot, the design of the environment they're going to be in hadn't been uh, completed. Uh, but you could see how well they integrated lighting-wise because of the, the way we were just integrating the, the um, footage into the scene in 3D. Yes, it's absolutely much better than um, going into Nuke uh, or After Effects and just try to like desaturate, put lighting, change the, the uh, do the colors, and Da Vinci, so the, the you in Unity just you put your elements and does most of it for you. One thing that's very crucial uh, uh, for experience is that um, when you're shooting these kind of scenes on, on set, it's important to write the scene numbers, the um, uh, take, and uh, there was one more thing that you need, uh, yeah, the lens. This, this time, uh, the time code wasn't um, active on the iPhone app uh, for the camera tracking. So uh, we would have different ways to create a slate, but now you can uh, sync the time code, which is great. See, you, you get to have, I always get to have the... She's the beta testing. The beta. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, but it's always good to have the lens uh, for yourself because when you're compositing, you want to know what lens you had um, to create the exact match. Otherwise, the perspective is not going to match. You want to go to the next. So this is another example of... Uh, the green screen, um, you know, when you bring it into the, the, this one is another example. So the, the background is a 3D background that I brought back in Nuke and composited in the back um, as a background for, for him. Um, so the, the lighting of the foreground is matched with the background afterwards. Um, so this is another example. You could take the green screen to your scene or you could bring the background um, to, to it. But, uh, before uh, bringing the background, what happens is that you can take your slate to Unity, um, place them where you would, you know, the actual big scene shows up to figure out where exactly the perspective of this background will be for a realistic look. Yeah, so in this case, the compositing is in Nuke, not in uh, Unity, and uh, uh, the background's exported with um, HDR EXRs. And then, of course, uh, you add the grain to match the grain for the background and foreground for a realistic look and perspective. And some of these shots are still work in progress. This one hasn't been uh, color timed yet. Yeah, this one is uh, old, old, old version. Um, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, so this shows the example of uh, what we already talked about. Um, the, the ray tracing is um, fascinating in Unity that actually uh, is something that I'm going to have Habib explain more. He's more technical than me. I'll just say ray tracing and <laughs> use it. But Habib has like a good, good full technical explanation there, about there's it. A, there's a bunch of options. So you can, you can use HDRP with real-time ray tracing and, and um, uh, ray trace SSGI. You have to enable DX12 in the project. And uh, I think it used to say experimental, but not anymore. It's kind of official now. Um, but you also have an option of path tracing. So if you want to just go full path tracing, you just add that as an override to the post-process volume. And it just takes over all the rendering and uh, will path trace for you. And <clears throat> you can just tell it how many samples you want to do, 3,000 or whatever you need. And it'll just do that per frame. Uh, and you know, it's, it's an amazing equivalent. Um, You'll need the, sometimes a little denoising in the comp, but um, it's a good option to have. And the, the reason that the grain has to be done in Nuke is that currently the grain uh, post-process um, is not HDR compatible. So if you want to get the high dynamic range output, um, you have to turn off grain and you have to make sure your tone mapping is set to none instead of ACES. So those two things, and also, 
you have to turn dithering off on the camera. Those, those are the things that would uh, not enable it to go out as a HDR. And then, um, you know, it's, it's really nice to be able to open a, an actual high dynamic range image. And in this case, like that bright light, you know, you can expose this frame down to black and then you'll still have the light source there. Uh, it, it, it gave Setar a nice range of color uh, capabilities when she's integrating the elements. And uh, because um, at the time when, when the director was um, shooting these, there was no, he didn't have uh, in mind what facility would look like. And um, I created that afterwards. Um, so, you know, it's, it's very easy. Then you see there is, you know, your, your, um, your talent is um, lit from the whatever, like this left side. And then you just go in, um, in Unity and um, in real time, just add the light there rather than going back in Nuke, figuring out what to do, look at, you know, um, in the old fashioned way. It's just very instant and um, makes it such a lifesaver. So you can bring in your green screen footage. What Setter would do is she would extract the green, uh, export uh, a video with alpha channels, bring that into Unity, and then she had, she had the character in Unity in terms of picking like background camera angle. So, and, and then in this case, Robert Patrick would be locked to the camera as opposed to the other shot where they're actually placed in the scene in 3D and then a camera moved on. These kind of shots, you just parent the, uh, the video to the camera and then um, she could basically location scout and find what angle makes sense. Um, so next we have a surprise. Hopefully you didn't catch that, but this was a VFX shot. <laughs> so um, traditionally you would probably have to um, matte paint something for the background. Uh, but this, um, the background for this, uh, if you go to the next, let's play it. maybe. Let's play first. This is a short shot. I mean, so there's several if, of these shots. If there is camera, if there is camera move um, in whatever green screen that you have, um, the more realistic uh, look would be to have a 3D background made um, whatever office that you want to, um, and uh, you can just grab uh, the, the texture from your. You know, I, I grabbed the texture from the carpet and just matched what I had in Unity and created the office. Um, the lighting is uh, real lighting. Um, it becomes like an actual environment, an office that you bring back and the perspective, you can match the perspective of the camera. Um, the lighting will integrate with your green screen, makes it look real. So um, if um, no one knows that, no one's gonna end up knowing that this actually was not, was a green screen because it looks very realistic um, for the final comp. Um, in the movie, right? She would always have a lot more fun working on the 3D scene than the green screen. <laughs> I don't like green screens. <laughs> but Necessary yeah. evil. Yeah. Like, let's give, give them a lot I of prefer, flexibility. I prefer but, yeah. to scan um, the actors and go build them in Unity <laughs> than extract the green. Um, it's faster and easier. Um, so this is similar pro volume lighting. Um, most of the light coming from the window and bouncing around some of the lights interior. Um, you know, she, she had fun picking what style of office with the director, you know, to, to um, uh, grab some assets and lay out the office and work on the materials. And, you know, originally I think they were maybe going to go for the huge boring office with lots of cubicles, but then we thought, it could be more like a San Francisco loft type. Yeah, you can. Yeah. You have options. You, you sit with the director and explore different ideas and then just build it and then just uh, match the textures. And just as a fun aside, um, the, the, the actress was meant to fit in the set, but she was taller than the partitions. That's why it turned into a VFX shot. <laughs> I don't know if you can see. Well, she's sitting here, but you know, when she was standing. Yeah, that so was, her head yeah. would go above the, above the partition. So it was like, that became, so this is like a dozen shots in the film with this. And just a really fun aside, um, there was a need for a ton of shots where they actually, the actors interact with an app. And normally that would have been a, a green screen with corner tracking markers and 
hundreds of tracking shots and screen replacements. And we decided, you know, why not actually build the app? And uh, so in this case, um, Colin Zargapur, my son, was able to build the app and uh, literally update it on the fly on set as the director would want different things. So it's, it's built in Unity and it actually uh, interacts. You know, it's, it's got all the interfaces that the actors needed. So they would just be able to you know, actually use it on, on camera. So that was a kind of a fun use of Unity. It saved Setari a lot of tracking. That saved a lot of tracking, yes. <laughs> I'm, I didn't have to use green screen. <laughs> so build the app in Unity, just use it. All right, so now this is... Next up, Comandante. Comandante we are would be Habib's um, so fun project. This is a, a pre-visualization for an Italian uh, movie, World War II film about a submarine um, that um, had, you know, this is a true story and, and it's, it, it's being developed. Uh, I'm working remotely with the director. I do virtual cinematography. Uh, and then get, you know, take direction in real time and I'm able to um, uh, take the assets and animation that are done in the uh, virtual art department in Italy and then um, do, do some of the lighting or VFX or whatever it needs to be for the setup. That's been actually a super interesting part of this project is it's not just about um, filming and camera angles, it's also about the look and mood. So we've done uh, several, you, you'll see different screenshots of the submarine with really, diff really different lighting conditions, uh, this being one of them. And we literally do these within 10 minutes. So before we start shooting, and sometimes it's a surprise to me, they're like, okay, this is a different set, <laughs> you know, we wanna go for a different mood. And then we'll end up moving all the lights, uh, you know, changing the post process. Uh, in this case, this, uh, the, we, we're using some procedural clouds um, and end up with something completely different looking. Um, really briefly, the process, is uh, the, to determine all the ship paths. Then I take the ship paths into uh, in Maya and I simulate the ocean and the and the vessels using the NVIDIA WaveWorks plugin for Maya. And then uh, there's uh, um, Manuel and Tim at NVIDIA that, that do an amazing job with that with that plugin. It runs in real time in Maya actually. And then I export the ocean as an Alembic and I bring in the ship movements as a locators, you know, just FBX locators that are baked out. And um, we, you know, I had to make a uh, speedometer of course in Maya so I could see how many knots they're moving because that's a critical thing. Uh, you know, the top speed of these things. Also the top speed of the actual submarine they're gonna build to do it for real. So the, the, these are all factors you have to consider. Um, for filming. So um, there's animation of the characters that are done in Italy and then I just receive a Unity package, I open it and I copy paste them into my timeline and I'm set to go for that particular scene. Then I, I place some VFX if we need to like have explosions or cannons going off, things like that. And then use the Unity virtual camera to do the shooting. Um, so there's uh, you know a lot of things to do with the look and feel. Uh, starting with concept art and actual, you know, artwork that referenced the event. The, so they did a lot of research. There's a, a you know, a naval um, expert that um, gives us a lot of advice about timings of things and uh, people's names and who did what. So that's been interesting. We also have labels in fr on, on top of the characters so that it's clear who's what. You know, there's, um, they all kind of have similar uniforms. Uh, and we have descriptions of the shots. There's another example of lighting down there on below. That's like a completely different look. In that case, it's uh, the ocean is like a Beaufort two or three. The the uh, simulation takes the Beaufort scale for waves in, or wind speed, um, and so you can put that in, and then the ships react accordingly. Uh, it has to be a complete match. Like you can't cheat. Uh, if they want to slide the animation, you can't just take the submarine animation and slide it back. It won't match the ocean. It'll look really silly. So the two have to go together. Um, if in, in timeline, you have to clip them together. So if I'm going to trim a shot or you know do do some speed ups, all of that has to be ocean and and uh, uh, the vessel animation together. Um, they've done a lot of work in terms of like setup of the scenes. 
like where people are and uh, where the cameras should be, those kind of things. So that helps me. But uh, of course, when, when it comes time to shoot, every, you know, all bets are off. You know, um, uh, Eduardo is going to decide where he wants to have a camera. And then um, it's been an incredible experience to, um, you know, find completely unexpected shots and locations that I wouldn't have thought of. And we watch the scene and, you know, um, he does this thing where he puts on the soundtrack he's thinking of having while we're shooting. And it gives me goosebumps sometimes because we're filming real time and the soundtrack's going off and you're watching the scene and you're like, wow, <laughs> I'm already feeling the emotion. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Can't wait to show you hopefully finished stuff next year. Um, this diagram on the upper right, that's the kind of thing where, you know, the, the historical recreation of specific events that we take into, uh, you know, into Maya and then try and recreate speed wise. And then this is what a typical scene looks like. On the left, you have all the different elements of the uh, submarine called Capellini. We have the take recorder. Um, you can see all the takes there for this is scene 58. And then uh, once we've done a shoot, they tell me uh, these are the shots we want to render. And then uh, I use the previs uh, package and uh, that's from Solutions. And it's a kind of a companion to the virtual camera um, and live capture packages. And you get the dynamic rigs with that, that I was showing uh, in my talk on Tuesday. Uh, and then you can go to the render takes and then just check all the, all the shots you want to render and that's it. And then you watch them render out in real time with audio, uh, ProRes 444 or um, H.264. Um, you can, you, there's a ProRes encoder right? that's just as fast as doing H.264 and it's mind blowing. <laughs> You know, and sometimes I forget to switch and I, it's in ProRes mode and I'm just like, I just watch it basically render on in real time. And I'm like, I go to the drive and it's like one gig file. <laughs> it just, you know, spit out. Got to be careful with that thing. Um, these are some examples of the dynamic rigs. We got the dolly here and a rail. You can see, uh, you know, the, the height, uh, the maximum allowable height for that particular thing where we're careful about lengths you know, making sure they know how long they have to move a camera. And um, in the case of rail, um, it's more about like, what would a handheld camera person do? Uh, I do sometimes try and follow characters by hand, uh, but it's kind of funny. Like there's a, you know, there's a scene where uh, the captain goes basically all the way to the bow and I'm in my tiny office. <laughs> so I, I have the dolly controls on one hand and the virtual camera. And I, you know, I try and follow him best I can. Um, we're working on rigs to do that kind of thing, um, or at least help us. But it ends up being pretty cool. Um, so you can see under the take recorder, there's actual nodes. We call these device nodes uh, for each rig. And then uh, the previous package, you can create different kinds of cameras, uh, camera rigs, sorry. And then the virtual camera gets parented to those rigs automatically. And then you can just switch, uh, switch rigs. And then this is the take recorder uh, menu I was telling you about. So you get, um, you just get a list of all the shots you want to render out. These things have been helping me, um, you know, we shoot an entire scene in about two hours. And then, you know, the next morning I had a list of what they wanted to render out. And then that just, you know, renders out in, in five or 10 minutes. Some of our shots, actually, some of the scenes are 30,000 frames and some of the takes are 11 minutes, 12 minutes, you know, just uh, on each camera because the, the, the edit, editors get in there. Um, one of the fascinating things is that the, the DP is on the Zoom calls as well as the director and the editors. So while we're actually trying to come up with these co compositions and shoot the shots, um, you know, the DP will say, no, actually, I prefer this lens or let's do this as a static or, you know, there's a there's a fun haggling between between the director and the DP because you know they have slightly uh, interesting and innovative ideas and they talk it out and uh, usually in Italian so I don't know what they're saying but then they tell me the result <laughs> they're like okay let's go here <laughs> um, but having that collaboration is really really amazing because they're basically uh, deciding how they want to shoot and then they get to see it. And then that changes their decision. 
about what they were thinking. And so the iterations and results end up being better. So this is like an example Zoom call, and um, we're very, very low in the water here. Um, that, that sort of, um, uh, and we also find out the timing. Uh, there's a we, audio track of the dialogue. So as we're filming, we're hearing dialogue. And then it also tells us how long we need for a scene. So uh, a lot of times I end up having to stretch things out because we realize like it, it, it takes a long time. You know, how much time does it take for the action that they're looking for? Um, one of the really cool uh, collaborations we've been able to do, uh, and huge thanks to uh, David Stump and uh, uh, Kevin uh, Todd Hogg, that is the visual effects supervisor, and uh, D David Stump's been advising us. Um, he's uh, an amazing uh, DP. Um, we've been collaborating with Cook uh, Lenses, um, and they uh, were able to, the, the, Kevin wanted to really have the director emulate the anamorphic lenses that they're gonna use. So they have the lens package already from Cook of what they wanna use, there's like serial numbers. And they have this amazing thing where you type the serial number and you get the distortion grid. They've calibrated all their lenses. And so they already know like what lenses they're gonna use on the shoot. And uh, they sent us the calibration grids for them and then uh, we were able to go in and match the anamorphic lens distortion. That's the grid you're seeing. We're making use of our Moses plugin that we have for you know, real world camera tracking. And that has this uh, very accurate uh, lens distortion that has the K1, K2, K3, whoever, whoever here's dealt with that stuff. So basically we adjust that to match the lens and then we have the anamorphic bokeh which you know, stretches the bokehs out. And it's a really incredible uh, difference to see. So for example, here's a shot with the distortion and here's the shot normal. And to, to have this effect in real time as you're filming is a really cool thing. And if you want to experience it, it's on the show floor in the Unity booth. You can actually uh, film, use the virtual camera live and see the distortion. Here's another uh, shot with the distortion. And this is without. And you know, since I've been filming mostly with a distortion on, I end up like thinking that's the natural look until I turn it off and I'm like, oh, you know, the, the, there's always something that gives you a feeling of, of what, you know, um, what the shot does. Uh, here's a couple of screenshots. It's just fun, to, really fun to, you know, have the level of visuals. This is the screen space ray tracing and all of that goodness. Um, we're also planning to export these scenes for the visual effects houses as USD and um, working with the team within Unity that's really pushing that and that's, that's an incredible pipeline to get going and um, we're, we're on our way, you know, so I've been able to export the submarine and the textures and the crew. Um, this is what, the timeline is like four times as tall as this. I'm blown away by how much I can put in this to this thing. Uh, it just keeps going. So uh, the little daytime lighting here. So on to the next project, Setare. So this one is LED. I love it because there's no green screen. <laughs> uh, for, for compositors, I don't know. I hope they feel the same. Uh, I prefer to do exciting things rather than sitting and dealing with hundreds of green screenshots. I prefer to be um, you know, innovative and do something else instead to have the same results. And um, uh, the, uh, the combination of LED and um, Unity has uh, been uh, very, very helpful for me. <clears throat> so this was a, a project during um, COVID called B3. It's about women's rights and hope and freedom. And uh, let's... Should I play? Yeah. Let's see we'll before play we talk some about of it. it. Yeah. Well, Can we crank up the sound?
So the project started um, with the song and a theme, and it's right down my alley. Um, I love freedom, human rights, technology. Mm. Uh, the 19th century enlightenment fascinates me, that how people got together, they were excited about um, technology and innovation, and they changed the world. So. Now, when we, you know, when I deal with Unity and uh, the technology and the real-time engine um, in collaboration with LED, um, and you know, using um, some green screen, putting all of the things together, uh, and cr giving the access to all the creators to to be able to innovate and make the our world a better world, and to be able to say um, something different. Um, or what you want to say um, um, with uh, the, the technology and access to resources that are available for everyone. So that's super exciting. This started with um, the initial concept art about the lighting, what we wanted to do. And um, I worked with Andy and Shaney, um, our, our um, talents, our singers. 
um, and we uh, talked about what we want in the project and I was able to just go on Unity and build the scenes and um, light them the way I wanted. Um, I was able to create three different environments, three different lighting. Uh, with LED screens, um, what was helpful was that, you know, efficiency. Mm, my background is in, in management and I like efficiency business. <laughs> that was my business hat. So you, you um, create your uh, concepts, uh, storyboard it, mm, so that way you can time um, time your, uh, exactly what your shot, the shots you have, uh, what comes after um, what, and then just makes the, t the day easier. We were able to shoot the, this uh, whole music video in one day with uh, three different environments. Um, um, this, I, I made up, I made all of the, the, the costumes for the, for the wings How myself. to stick arrows in the back of a thin dress <laughs> and have them stay. Yeah, you could be creative with all of these, depending on the budget. We didn't have a budget for this. A little as bit much, of 3D so. printing uh, yeah. these guys to hold the hold the arrows, and uh, so Tara had to number these so that we could uh, place them onto the arrows uh, as the shots were being filmed. And then, um, in order to keep track, we had to put numbers on the back of the sticks, which then later she had to remove <laughs> from Just one of the VFX it, shots. Just painted, guys. Just painted. <laughs> Otherwise, they have to track and erase it. So uh, as you see, LEDs necessarily don't um, replace green screens. There are moments that we actually want to put the talent later back in the scene, do, go, do location scouts, lighting it. Um, so I turned the, the, green, the LED screen to green screen, shot the talent, and then later I brought it back to, my, um, uh, to, the, to the forest. And um, you can just go later, do your location scout, move the lights, change everything on, on the fly and shoot it. So right. the same technique as the one with the, the holodeck room, the, the actors filmed and then placed into the scene in 3D and then a different camera move done on post. But when you film the talent, you want to have a lock off camera in that case, because they need to stick to the ground. Um, but we have um, we kind of categorized the different types of shots. So you have an LED shot, which is all in camera, final VFX, basically. Uh, everything you saw in this music, music video, nothing was retouched. So everything you saw with the ground to the screen was all done as set dressing. Um, um, we had an amazing guy, uh, Bob Wasserman, who, who did the set dressing for us. We were blown away by how much he was able to do. This was a 36 by a 10 foot screen. Um, it was 1.8. The 1.8 millimeters, 1 .8 yeah. Millimeter. Uh, the, the, the LED screen from, was from Orbital Virtual uh, with AJ Wedding uh, running that. And then the location was uh, Fonco Studios uh, with Fon Davis um, helping us with that. So those shots, the, the only uh, thing I had to do is there was one shot that uh, needed, needed uh, some, some touch up somewhere, but everything else was in camera. Uh, so you have LED, uh, sorry, we had green screen uh, footage, which in this case we use the LED for green. Then you have all CG shots. Uh, these are all rendered straight out of Unity with Final Pixel in the same pipeline we talked about, HDR, EXRs. But um, the nice thing is Setara was able to build these sets, use the set on the LED screen, and use the same set for the all CG shots. So you're sharing the same data that way. And then the fourth type here is when she put the green screen character into the three all, all CG environments. Then there's actually a fifth type, which is LED screen shoot that then you add uh, CG rendered uh, elements out of Unity on top. So in this case, some of the arrows were actually uh, on the LED screen, but uh, she, had, she rendered some of the arrows on top and composited them because they needed to be in front of her. So you can do these kind of hybrid type, type of shots. We should go to the video for the behind the scenes, yeah? Mm-hmm, yeah. So um, some of my friends, when we talked about that, we shot all of this in one day, they're like, that's not possible. You can't do it that way, but yes, you can. If you plan it um, ahead of time, you plan your shots, storyboard everything, um, plan, um, talk to your... Um, so I had a screenshots of my environments. I sent them to uh, Bob, um, who did the 
the set dressing for me. Everyone was ready as we changed clothes and did change the makeup. The the lighting changed. Uh, God bless him. That, that, that was the DP. <laughs> the Leo. DP changed the lighting for us, and I already had examples of the lighting for for his reference um, as screenshots. Mm, so that was super helpful. This set is not actually that that big, right? It was very small, but you're able to like plan um, ahead of time and- Foreground elements are good. Yeah. Foreground props. Um, you know, calibrating, uh, again, in this case, using the depth sensor on the uh, Unity virtual camera to do the camera tracking. Whenever you're, you know, in this case, the actors are actually standing on a real ground and you're just looking for some parallax of the background. So uh, you don't necessarily need like a super accurate uh, camera tracking, it's more for parallax. So that way the depth sensor was working fine for that. There's our set dressing, uh, Bob. Um, and you know, the lighting as, um, once the DP changed his lighting, then we could go back to Unity Live and change the lighting to match, to make sure our foreground and background were actually, we would see no line in between. And um, you can actually in real time change the fog uh, um, on LED to match the fog on, on, on the set. And... Um, uh, yeah, that was, was actually uh, really interesting to get the atmosphere to match. So we had fog uh, in the scene and then they smoked up the room. And as they smoked the room, I could dial how much fog on the background so that we had this kind of, uh, you know, just the right amount of transition on the ground that we needed. Um, it, it, you know, we kept changing. There's basically four performers, two different environments, two sets of lighting. So it was hard to keep track of. And, and at some point we were moving so fast, we would just change the set, change the lighting. And then we would tell, uh, ask the Leo, the DP, I'm like, okay, let's shoot. And he's like, Wait, but I have to adjust the real lights for you know to make the actors match like they're standing there. And we were kept forgetting you got the real light. So here's the fog machine. And you see the fog on the screen, and then as they're smoking it, you get this beautiful transition, and you can just dial both of them and get the balance you want. Uh, so it was really a fun way to work. And, and you know, sometimes a, a rule of thumb would be like. Um, Maybe in some 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 of the scenes was better to, to add the fog afterwards in um, as a com you know composite on top uh, depending on the shot. Mm. You could see the transition on the ground. Sometimes we would get confused. We'd ask Bob to move something, and he'd be like, "No, that's on your screen," or vice versa. Um, you know, n normally it's a little. I, I thought we we're going to have a lot of a touch up to do with that transition area. But um, the way it ended up on camera looked pretty good. Um, here's some more of that footage. Uh, the, the, the behind the scenes camera was not synchronized to the LED. That's why you're seeing banding. Uh, it was just on a different frame rate. But yeah, here you can see on screen, we can just see the transition and, and tune things. Uh, lots of uh, directing the the action and the performance, and then uh, of course playing the playing the music loud, which was fun while I, while we're shooting. Yes, I always like to think outside of the box. Um, so uh, you know, for me, it was very important to be able to like plan everything ahead of time. Have my I R knew exactly where things in edit will be placed, what do I need where, and I had them all um, um, uh, storyboarded for myself. And we talked with DP and we knew exactly what we're, sh what we're shooting. This was shot on a Sony Venice. Um, absolutely amazingly sensitive camera. You can see how dark that, that you know, the room, we could make the room. Uh, the LED screens were running, these are planar panels, they were running at like 10% brightness. So they could have like, you know, blinded everybody if they wanted to. Um, but we wanted some of the shots to be dark and moody. And then, you know, we could barely see with our eyes and the camera picked up all the detail beautifully, you know, with, with minimal grain. So the, what's available nowadays to us technology-wise is just absolutely incredible.
And you know what you see on your screen when um, as the DP is shooting exactly right there, I was able to see exactly what's happening on my scene. Do I see flickers? Do I see this? And we would reshoot it again to make sure we have the final pixel done on the day so I didn't have to go back and fix it afterwards. So that's super helpful. Um, one more thing. Go to the green screen. Mm. <laughs> There's, yeah, and the green screen on LED actually the, very super helpful and efficient. she opens the wings. So they yeah. had filaments to open the wing. I don't know where that shot is. Yeah, there. They open it with filaments. Um, just in interest of time, we're going to leave some uh, time for Q&A. So mm -hmm. um, just go to... Um, um, I'll skip these. These are very the detailed uh, pipeline things to do with production and pre-production and how you can basically use the real-time engine throughout the whole process and take advantage of the same assets, you know, asset reuse. So that's our presentation. Thank you. Thank we have you. about five minutes for questions. Awesome, five minutes. Does anybody have any questions? Questions. The, the level of nerdiness is uh, whatever you want, you know. <laughs> we can have a range. So, um, you know, the, the nice range of what, what, what's possible, you go all the way from, uh, you know, pre-visualization, uh, composition, you know, very, very loose creative part of the process to actually creating backgrounds for shots, uh, to have access to HDR EXRs that you can output you know, for shots is really, really uh, freeing. And let me tell you, there's there's times where she's had to like render. She started out trying to render some stuff in uh, you know traditional rendering pipelines, and and you know you wait overnight to get your 10 second shot, you know, barely rendered out, and then and it's like, okay, to, <laughs> to hell with that. We're going after with real this, time. After my Maya class was <laughs> very interesting. So like my um, instructor was like, yes, you go to Arnold and you just do the little screen and you uh, click render to see the light. I was like, no, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> One hour later. Do an idiot and yeah. do it afterwards over there. <laughs> it's a l level of patience, you know. You have yes, to have I was like, no, nobody does For that traditional anymore. graphics. But anyway, so the, you know, there's definitely advantages to uh, beautiful offline rendering, but uh, the yes. real-time stuff's catching up. And um, I think to see your the results of your tuning in real time is just like there's so much more you gain from that than you you do from like whatever the you know minutia difference might be in the pixel and the result. This is the, the creative decisions you were able to. Because at the end of the day, it's the you know it's it's the artist, not the not the brush. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, you know, to take that all the way to to LED screen, the whole gamut of use, take the asset, you know, use it to do the previs, use it on the LED screen, use it for your final pixel, you know, CG shots is is really cool. There's got to be questions. We were very thorough. Just, we were very yeah. thorough. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's super exciting to be able as a creator to use Unity. Um, really, I can't wait to be able to use. Um, the new tools. Yeah, so some QR codes for the face capture app. We didn't talk about that, but it's, it's available. Um, also on the on your iOS device to track your face um, and, and, and record that. The virtual camera app is available for free on the App Store, and you get the live capture package on the Unity to use it. And um, so create a way. Yeah. Um, you know. We don't look, have to look. have like a lot of resources and money to be able to create. Um, everyone can actually have a voice with Unity, right? I, I get very excited about it. Awesome. Well, thank, thank you, you very guys much. so much. Thank you.